Welcome to a narrative of love, a series of conversations with thought leaders and spiritual teachers about their understanding of love and how they see the significance of love in our personal and political life. Today, a very distinguished guest is joining us, Professor Lord John Alderdice. As a leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland for more than ten years, Lord Alderdice played a significant role in the negotiation of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. He then became the first speaker of the new Northern Ireland Assembly. And the chairman of the Liberal Democrat Party in the House of Lords at Westminster. Lord Alderdice's work on democracy and peace building has been recognised with many fellowships, honorary degrees, and prizes, including in 2015 with the Liberal International's highest honour, the Prize for Freedom. Welcome, John. Thank you so much. For joining a narrative of love conversation, here is the context. Globally, we are living in troubled times, times of change. Some say we are in an age of bewilderment because our existing narratives that explain who we are and what we value have collapsed, and new ones are yet to emerge that might take us out of the current ampas. At the Spirit Humanity Forum, we are concerned with the core human values in governance and leadership. Our hope for this series of conversations is to create a space to explore a different narrative that might help shift our collective consciousness. So, let's start the conversation from here, John. May I take you back to your childhood? Growing up with a father who was a member of the clergy, and knowing that for most religions the common word is a love, how were you taught about it? What have you learned about it? Well, Sherto, it's lovely to join you in a conversation, and about such important and frighteningly topical issues.、Um, So I'm very happy to do that, and to start, as you suggested, with my home and family and background, and how did I learn about love?、Uh, in all sorts of ways, in relationship, in thinking, in in relationship with other people, as you said, not just those personal relationships. And my father, as you say, was a clergyman. My mother、uh, didn't. Take up a, a job outside of the home and the church.、Uh, before she was married, she had a, a, a job in, in administrative secretarial work, but、uh, she committed herself also to working、uh, as, if you like, part of the church team with with my father. And in, in fact, that was that was kind of how we saw ourselves as a family. I am the eldest of four. I have two sisters and a brother, and we all felt ourselves to be part of that. And my father and mother's personalities were were somewhat different.、Uh, my father was, or at least appeared to be, the more confident one,、um, and 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 outgoing. And my mother was outgoing, but she she had to make quite an effort to do that because she was quite an anxious person.、Uh, when she had been quite young, there had been various health difficulties in her family, and I think she found it difficult to get over some of those difficulties. But she was an extraordinarily loving person,、uh, and an example of how she wasn't very confident was that when my father died, there was a big funeral and lots of people came and so on and so on, and and then she herself developed cancer and she was obviously going to die, and she said, "Oh well, don't worry about a big funeral for me. No, nobody will want to come and and and, and recognise me. I'm not very important." And we said, "That's not true at all." And in fact. Um, they had lived for the later part of their lives in the countryside, up in the glens of Antrim. And when she did pass away, there were huge numbers of people came to the funeral. And, and I'll always remember there was these these great big farmers from the hills standing there, 
uh, with tears streaming down their cheeks <laughs> in remembrance of this lady, and, and she was a lady. So I, I grew up in an atmosphere which was a very loving atmosphere within the family itself, um, but also one that saw itself in service of other people and of the values which, which they held to be important. And although, you know, for my father, theological ideas and values were important, and, and indeed what was happening, the violence and trouble in our Northern Ireland community was important, uh, that wasn't really the driver at the back of it. The, the driver at the back of it was, was loving God, uh, though with an exploration of what that really meant, and, and loving other people, which was essentially not doing to other people things you didn't want to be done to yourself, and on the other hand, more positively, doing things to other people and with other people and having relationships with people of a kind that you yourself felt to be nourishing and positive and good and, and worthwhile. And so I find, I find myself extremely fortunate to have grown up with, with those two parents and with my two sisters and my brother. Uh, it, it gave me not just a, a positive and nourishing background, but also an encouragement to face the world in a, in a slightly challenging way, asking questions and trying to probe and and find a way forward and to find a, a better way of living, but both personally and, and, and in the wider society. Now, so you have um, devoted much of your life to understanding the process of, of relationship, whether it's destructive or constructive. Could you say more about how, how you, um, why, why you think psychiatry or psychology can be an answer? When I was trying to understand or make sense of what was going on in my community in Northern Ireland, and also to try to think of ways in which we could improve the situation or resolve the problems, uh, I started off uh, trying to understand the politics. And, uh, and I would have these arguments and conversations over Sunday lunch with my father because he'd just preached a sermon and I might agree with some of it and not agree with other bits. So this was a very good training for politics, engaging and arguing with him. My poor mother just wanted us to have a quiet Sunday lunch, but the two of us were interested to struggle with these questions. And of course, at that time, uh, political science was saying that people were basically rational actors operating in their best socioeconomic and power interests. But that didn't make much sense to me because the way that people were behaving was not in anybody's interest. It was just destructive, destructive of other people, of course, but also destructive of themselves. And you might say, well, you have to destroy things to build something new. But you know, year after year, decade after decade, there was no evidence of anything terribly new, just, just destruction. So I thought, I need to try to understand why do people behave in these self-destructive ways? And I thought, well, psychiatrists spend their time working with people who do self-destructive things. Maybe if I could understand a bit more of that uh, way of thinking and working. I, I could apply that not just to individual people, but to a whole community that was behaving in that kind of way. So I went into medicine and into psychiatry and into psychoanalysis to try to explore those kinds of, of questions. At the same time, I was going into political life and I was trying to understand things from a political perspective, um, albeit with a, a psychological uh, attitude or approach. And I, I wrote to the various political parties in Northern Ireland to try to understand what they were saying and realised that the approach that seemed natural to me and also that, that created a, a therapeutic space was what might be called a, a liberal uh, politics. That's to say one that believes that, that individual people have the right as well as the responsibility to develop their own ideas and their way of thinking about things. Um, because all of us will have different perspectives, of course, but that richness of diversity is actually important. It's not as though there is one simple, single way of, of viewing things. And of course, in Northern Ireland, there certainly wasn't one simple way because you had one group of people who were saying, well, we know what the future ought to be within the United Kingdom. And then other group of people say, well, that's not what the a good future would look like at all. It would be out of the United Kingdom and part of a united Ireland. And indeed, the, the body of people that I was involved with, the, the Alliance Party, which is a liberal political party, said, well, it's not about United Kingdom or United Ireland, it's about a united Europe. 
So th these were very different perspectives as to what was the good. And the question was, how could we find a way of engaging all of those? It wasn't going to be helpful or successful to say, well, one of them will have to win out over the others. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it wasn't very clear that you could have some coming together of these different ideas in a way that was going to be satisfactory. So at that stage, I was, I was struggling with what, what politicians in general, but liberals in particular struggle with, and that was structures, the political structures. We needed to have better structures in order to, for, for things to be resolved. And I worked quite a lot of that for quite a long time. And then eventually it began to become clear to us uh, as we moved into trying to construct a peace process that it, it really wasn't about finding new clever structures that would resolve the problems, but of, it, it was a question of dealing with disturbed historic relationships. And if we did that, then out of that, new structures could emerge, could be created and developed which would help and facilitate better communal relationships. But it wasn't really a question of constructing new structures and institutions and constitutions, and that that would solve the relationship problem. It was really the other way around, that we had to address the relationship question, and then out of that, we could construct new institutions, or, or, or you could put it in, that they would emerge uh, out of that. Well, this is really interesting. Could you just say a bit more about that? Because, as you said, in principle, people tend to tend to think that the conditions that gave rise to fascism, or injustice, humiliation, fear, despair, whatever that, all, all that, as long that these conditions prevail, they will remain to be the destructive force to relations in terms of in, in the context of relationship. And um, but you want to address relationship now. Just give us an example that how by entering the relationship and take relationship as the primary focus, it helps resolve the structural dimensions of of, of our life. Well, uh, like most other people, my perspective is very much influenced by my own personal experience. So I refer for the Northern Ireland dimension of things, not because it's uh, the only example or maybe even the best example, but it's the one that I, I know best and have worked at uh, for longest. W one of the challenges when I started to get involved in politics was uh, the, the deep division meant that there are ways of behaving and relating publicly as a politician um, that you have to think about. One of those was that during that period of time, uh, Sinn Féin was very supportive of the IRA campaign. And therefore, most politicians, uh, most people in public life, but especially most politicians, did not want to engage with Sinn Féin because of its support for the IRA. And um, uh, one of the, the symbols of that was not just refusal to appear, for example, on television in a programme with them, but to shake hands publicly with them. And it was, it's an interesting thing from a psychological point of view, because in a way, it, it, what you were saying was, I'm not shaking hands with you, you've got blood on your hands. You know, it's a symbolic, it's a, it's a metaphorical thing. So I'm not going to engage with you because you've got blood on your hands. I, I'm not gonna show uh, any kind of relationship with you because I don't approve of, of what you stand for and I disagree with you. And I want you to change that to have a better relationship with you, but but I'm not going to engage. Well, when I was first elected to Belfast City Council, within minutes, I mean, a very few minutes, uh, one man came over to me and put his hand out to shake hands. And I immediately knew who he was. His name was Alex Maskey, and he was the chief whip of Sinn Féin on Belfast City Council. And, and his family background was, was involved with the IRA and so on. He wasn't, it wasn't just a sort of academic interest in republicanism. It was very actively involved in things. So, so there's immediately a question for me. What do I do here? Do I shake hands with this guy or do I not? And I don't have a whole lot of time to think about it. And I don't have a, the opportunity to phone a friend or have a consultation or whatever. I've got to decide what to do. And I thought, well, I could simply do what most other politicians are doing at the moment. And that's say, well, um, I'm not going to be shaking hands with you or just turn and walk away or something of that kind. And I was 
very much aware, I wasn't so naive that I didn't understand that part of him doing this was to put me on the spot. It was in a way to say, well, what kind of a guy is this? He's going to be serving on the city council with me. What, how is he going to react to things? Is he the nice guy that he says, or is he just the same as all the rest? So whatever. And I thought, well, what's the fundamental principle? The principle is that you engage with other people as human beings. You disagree with them quite profoundly, and you're not naive about it. But, but if I want to try to make a difference in Belfast City Council, as at that stage the, 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 the premier elected body in Northern Ireland, I've got to be prepared to find a way of working with people like this guy and others that I disagree with, albeit they may or may not be involved in supporting a violent campaign. So I shook hands with him. And uh, he said, I hope we can work together. And I said something that didn't commit me to any close working with him, but wasn't negative or, or rejecting of him. Now, what was interesting about that is that I had to find a way of responding to him, which was quite challenging for me. But that relationship never developed to some kind of friendship or anything of that kind, but it did become an important connection as we worked politically. So for example, um, when uh, my own father fell ill and was in hospital, and we went in to visit him and he was really quite ill, who should be in the hospital bed on the other side of, of, the, of the ward, but Alex Maskey's mother. And so I and my family were coming in and uh, meeting with my father and very worried about him, obviously, and his family were coming in just directly across in the ward. And one day, uh, I, was, I don't know whether it was Alex or it was one of his brothers, came to my brother and he said, what's going on here? And my brother said, what are you talking about? He said, well, your mother comes over and she sits down on the bed and she talks to my mother. Uh, obviously saying, well, you know, this is, this, this is not the sort of thing that's supposed to happen in Northern Ireland. And I think my brother said something like, well, my mum's like that, you know. Um, but, but again, it was, it was part of this, we're engaging with each other as human beings. We're families who are very worried about our parents here. Well, uh, after a period of time, I was, I'd done a lot of things politically, and then I, I went on to the House of Lords and I stood down and my brother was elected uh, as a city councillor in my place. And he went in and he, he became the Lord Mayor. But then he came to me one day and he said, John, we've got a bit of an issue here. And I said, what's that, Dave? He said, well, we now have the, 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 the casting vote or the balancing vote. And if the unionists put somebody up and we vote for them, they'll get elected mayor. And if the Nationalists or Republicans put somebody up and we vote for them, they'll get it. So we have to make a decision what we do here. He said, yeah. Uh, he said, well, I think that given what has been happening in the process, IRA, giving up violence and so on, we should be prepared to vote for Sinn Féin. And I said, well, you know, I think you're right. Now, I said, don't expect anybody to thank you for it, including Sinn Féin, right? You're not going to have a good time. But, but... I think you're right, and you need to just be prepared for whatever happens. Well, who did Sinn Féin propose? Alex Maskey. And so when my brother persuaded his small number of colleagues to vote with him, Alex was elected the first ever Sinn Féin Lord Mayor of Belfast. And in fact, he was a very good Lord Mayor and a very thoughtful one. Um, he, he wasn't any less Republican than he'd ever been. He didn't give up his vision, which was for a united Ireland, not being part of the United Kingdom and so on. But it created a context where it was possible to work. And he then he went on to be the chief whip of the uh, Sinn Féin group in the, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I worked with him a, a, a lot. So the, the point of all of that is it, it's, a, it's a practical example of how if you can find a way of engaging with the person beyond the politics, then you can actually begin to make changes in the politics that are more humanizing and, and exemplify this idea of dealing with disturbed historic relationships and trying to produce better historic relationships, not by becoming palsy walsy and all friends and all of those kinds of things, not because you come to an agreement about exactly what the future should hold and so on, not, not that at all, but you can still have a, 
a working, respectful, humane relationship with people with whom you differ very deeply. God, that's so profoundly beautiful. Um, thank you very much. So how can Spirit Humanity Forum offer a space where leaders will step into and, and feel that we can transform our, our love and legions and passion towards a generative force rather than a destructive one? Well, there is here a profound dilemma. I, I remember during the talks process, there was always a question about how we would conduct things. Everything down to the shape of the table and who was at it and, and particularly the order in which people would speak. And we had great discussion about that. And eventually it was decided to do it in alphabetical order. And this meant that I always went first because Alliance was A, and, and therefore it was it, it came before the, the various other participants. So this was a, a bit of a challenge, a, a little bit like the, the, the taster for the king at the medieval banquet, you know? He, the taster had to taste the wine and if, if it was poisoned, then he died and the king knew not to drink it. But on the other hand, if he drank it and survived, then the king could drink the wine. Well, it was a little bit like that for the others, I think. If I made a presentation and I survived, then they knew that it was possible to, to do something here. So the question for me was, how do I address this? And it was clearly very difficult. And I remember one particular session, uh, the Irish government was joining with, with the other parties and uh, this was going to make up for a lot of anxiety. And I said, we've got a great dilemma here uh, because if we reach an agreement with each other, then there will be a sense amongst ourselves and amongst our people that we have betrayed those who came before us, those who gave their lives in defense of the various positions that we hold as we come to this table. On the other hand, if we fail to reach an agreement with each other, we will be betraying our children and our grandchildren because we will be handing on to them a situation which is as bad as the one we inherited and arguably even worse because hopes have been raised then dashed again. So I said, we have a, a profound moral dilemma, profound dilemma for all of us here. And, and there is no straightforward way of ensuring that both of these responsibilities or loyalties uh, are able to be satisfactorily addressed. Now, I think there's an important principle there, and it is to recognize that in all relationships, there are challenges, dilemmas, and contradictions. Isaiah Berlin, when he was talking about there not being an agreement on the good, he said, well, you know, what is good for the rabbit is not good for the fox, and vice versa. You know? So it's, it's not as though there is a good, and if we could all just follow that line and that way of, of being, everything will be fine. It's it's more complicated than that, one might even say more complex uh, than that. So that's, that's one element of it. And in fact, Freud said that there were three impossible professions. Education was one. Psychoanalysis, of course, was a second. And government, he said, it's an impossible profession. You can't, you can't get it right, no matter how you try. So what he was talking about was this dilemma, these contradictions uh, that you have to engage with. Freud also said, when he was asked about psychoanalysis, he said psychoanalysis is a treatment of love. It is fundamentally about how you engage with the other person and enable them to engage with themselves and then ultimately with other people in a way that encompasses all these difficulties and contradictions. That part of ourselves, which is a destructive element and that part, which is a constructive element. Uh, it's, it's not a question of getting rid of one in favor of the other. It, it's a question of how you're able to transform the relationship between these various aspects of ourselves and of our relationships with others. That's the challenge. And one of the difficulties and dilemmas is, and he ran into this himself, he started to try to create ways of understanding all of this. Theories, metapsychology, he called it. And of course, uh, he, he developed it, but he also changed these ideas as time went on. 
but when you do that kind of thing, your your mental for your 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 cognitive apparatus is struggling to make sense of things that is really hard to make simple cognitive sense of because there are contradictions in there, and when we find contradictions, we try to iron them out or rule one element out and another element in, rather than accepting that there are really important contradictions that are in there. And in our feelings, we know this. We know that we can love and hate a person at the same time. Ambivalence. You have your child does something or your lover does something. And on the one hand, you love them. But on the other hand, you could you know, cheerfully choke them at that particular point. And this notion of ambivalence is really very important in our feelings. But how do you make mental sense of that? And this was one of the, the things that, that Freud himself worked at and tried to explain. Now, one of the things I think I discovered was that like lots of liberals, I was very keen on developing structures and ideas and, and mechanisms. And we wrote lots of stuff about, about all of this and we tried to work at this. But I began to discover that, that actually there are inherent contradictions that you need to incorporate into your engagement. With people. What do we need to be doing? Well, I think we need to be uh, helping people who are leaders to understand that, um, first of all, um, if they try to produce an entirely straightforwardly rational set of politi policies, uh, they probably won't work very well. That doesn't mean you behave irrationally, but it just means that you're a bit humble about how things will work out. Uh, the second thing I think is perhaps even more important, and that is, how you come to politics. If you come to politics with, with a genuine wish to contribute to things being better in the relationships between people in your community and other communities, and you keep that in your mind and in your heart, that that's what you're trying to do, and you realize that you may fail, you may not be successful, but, that, but it is still the way to live and work then that's a different thing from coming to politics with the idea that you want a position, that you want to, to, to have a particular uh, way of functioning to, to, to win out against every other one, that you want to have your special place. Because if you want the, that second thing, then, then you will often do things that are damaging to relationships and quite often damaging to yourself in order to achieve that particular goal, which is not the goal of making things better for people. And I suppose the final thing to say is that we were in my generation relatively successful at making progress, but we were only able to do it because other people in previous generations laid a foundation that we could build upon. And, and they lived and worked and passed on in many cases without seeing the successful result of the seeds they had planted. And, and sometimes for individual people or for whole generations, they are the generations of the plowers and seed planters rather than necessarily the generation of the reapers and harvesters. And that's something that we have to accept. We're, 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 we're part of a larger community than just this generation. And it may be that it's our children and our children's children who will benefit from what we do. Um, and ultimately that is what we can change. We can't change the past and how it was for our predecessors, but we can perhaps contribute to a better future. May I follow up on the last point about the importance of learning from our collective histories. Elsewhere, you also talked about the fact that when we are confronted with the social and political antagonism, we're not only bickering about the land, the border, the socioeconomic issues, or even perceived injustice. It is also about the wounds of history, if I may say. To a certain extent, our identity can be defined by our collective trauma. So the historical nature of our human journey cannot be ignored when we seek the path of our collective future making. What well, maybe that's why John the Salk advised our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. So what are your thoughts 
on the importance of healing collective trauma as one of the key steps towards a loving world. I think it's very important to understand that there's not just a history of the past, but there's a development from the past. It's very unwise to, for example, expect a child of three or four to have the understanding of a young person of 15 or 16, or indeed of an older person of 35 or 40. It, it, it's very unwise because that's not the reality of the way they are as a person, even from a very physical point of view in terms of the way their brain functions. It doesn't function in the same way. And certainly the way they feel and the way they relate is not the same at a very early age than at a later age. And I think it's the same with societies, that societies develop. Uh, you mentioned history and, 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 and the past, and that's absolutely right and important. But it's also the case that the way societies functioned at times in the past, not the same as the way societies function now, for all sorts of reasons. And we need to understand that and, and to try to understand the way things were, as well as how they are now, and not to extrapolate back and say that, well, they should have had the same understanding of things as us, uh, any more than it's reasonable to expect that a child of three or four should have the understanding of an adult in their 20s or 30s or 40s. The second thing is the impact of experience from the past. And you've mentioned the trauma and the damage and harm of unpleasant things that have happened in the past. That's true. But there are also things that are regarded as positive things from the past, to which very often people want to return because they were positive experiences. Now, the dilemma about both trauma and positive experiences from the past is that it's sometimes quite difficult to let them be the past. And, and to understand that one of the important developments that we make as individuals as we grow up and as communities is to be able to differentiate between what has happened, what is happening, and hope, what we hope or fear may happen. As a community, of course, we don't tend to talk so much about the memory of the past, we talk about the history of the past. And, and still with the history of the past, particularly if you live in a society where there's a sense of existential threat or damage, people keep living as though the past was the present, and even as though the past was an inevitable future. And one of the things that we have to try to do is not to forget about the past, but to help people to understand it is the past, whether that's a traumatic past or a victorious past, that it is the past. And in trying to create a new future, we need to recognize that past, respect it, but understand that it is the past. So part of our struggle is to is to try to differentiate out this temporal challenge that we have to negotiate as we're growing up. And when we get to be quite old or quite ill, we have to negotiate again. So, so these, are, these are human challenges that are to do with our finitude and the way that we function. You're, but you're quite right. You can't ignore the past, good or bad, but, but you have to try to find a way of putting it in its proper place. Let me, once again, return to those three important insights you shared early. Now, this time, I want to go back to the first two. And that is how we must consider the dilemma and hold the ambiguity whilst engaging in generative relationships. And equally, we must acknowledge, the, acknowledge that in addition to the rational discourse or discussions, we must also take into account the emotional contents of human experience. On these, I wonder if you would say more about um, the following dialogue, listening, and the silence. Silence in all forms of silence, of quietude, and in, in all meanings of the word. I'm asking you this question because 
because these are the three pillars of the Spirit Humanity Forum. So to what extent these three values, dialogue, listening, and the silence, might have a place in our working through the current collective challenges? I think there's not just a place, I think they're absolutely essential. Um, it, because if we don't find a way of engaging in conversation, uh, then we will find ourselves acting in ways that are not informed by that conversation. And, and often those will be destructive actions because they're not informed by thinking and engaging with the other person with whom we may agree or disagree. So what is important then politically? The key element, one could argue there were many key elements, but a key element of the talks process was exactly what it says. It was talking and conversing and listening and engaging and dialogue. But, but it has to be a dialogue in which you're not just simply trying to unburden yourself of your thoughts, but where you're having to listen to the person who's saying something to you that you don't like or don't agree with. So for example, when George Mitchell was chairing the, the, the talks process, the way it was established by agreement, by negotiation, was that each of the parties, and there were 10 parties and two governments at the table, each of the parties would be asked a question and they would take whatever time they wanted to respond to that question. And that might be an hour or it might be three days. And everybody else had to sit and listen to people with whom they fundamentally disagreed saying what they thought and what they believed in the knowledge that they would get a chance to both ask them questions and ultimately to do the same thing again. But he held that space where it was not just possible, but a requirement of engagement that you listened to the other person as well as spoke what you believed about things. So, so this notion of dialogue and conversation and listening is absolutely essential. But then there's this question that you describe of, of, of quiet, of silence. And it seems to me that, that there are various aspects to this, but one aspect is that of reflection, of, of taking the time, not just to have a conversation with yourself, but to reflect. Now, this arose for me at the beginning of the new assembly when we were setting things up. And in the House of Lords, at the beginning of the day, one of the bishops, who's a member of the House of Lords, conducts a short time of prayer, using prayers that have been used every sitting day for three or four hundred years. And you don't have to come in, but some of the people who come in are, 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 are not Christians, they're Jews or Sikhs or Muslims or whatever, but we have that time. And, and the purpose of those prayers is really to say, here is your responsibility to address difficult and challenging issues, not from the perspective of what is best for you, but for what is right and good and best for the country and its people. Okay. So when I suggested that we should start the assembly each day with a time of prayer, uh, Dr. Paisley and his party said, absolutely not. And uh, they said, we're not, we, we don't feel at all comfortable. In fact, we would not be prepared to pray with Catholics. So no, we're not prepared to do that. But I, I really didn't want to let go of the importance of a silent reflection at the start where we would all have to think about our responsibilities and the job that we were there to do. So eventually we got agreement that we would stand in silence for two minutes and those who wished to pray could pray and those who didn't wish to pray didn't have to pray, but there would be a period of silence in the chamber, nobody else watching, nobody else present. And the purpose of it really was to help people to reflect on what they were there for. And, and everybody agreed to do that. And so that's how, how the day started and still does. 
Uh, so I do think that this notion of reflection, of thinking, what am I about? What am I here for? What is this for? Is really a rather important thing. And particularly to try to do it in a way which is respectful of other people, that you are there with them. And together we have to try find a way of, of, of doing what is best for, for our community. So I, I entirely agree with your sentiments that dialogue, that listening, and that silence, but particularly a silence that is not the silence of sleep, but the silence of reflection and the silence of engagement sometimes without speaking with others in the, in the present, but also with others in the past and the future. Perhaps the relational dimension of our life is at the heart of our personal and collective well-being. So in your view, how else might we understand well-being? And could this, could well-being, our global well-being, collective global well-being, be the common good that we have been seeking? I think the notion of well-being is very important. It's understanding in a more, in a more rounded way what it is to be a human being and to be a human being in relationship with others and with, with the wider creation or universe or how, however you want to describe it. So I think that's very positive. And, and we, we, sh we need to be exploring it. One of the difficulties is that if we have a, a model or set of understandings uh, that is limited, as all our understandings necessarily are, then it will skew the notion of well-being when well-being is meant to be something that is global and complex. So, for example, if you say, well, uh, we need to be able to measure well-being, either because as a manager, I want to measure it, or as an economist, I want to measure it, or as a scientist, I want to measure it. Well, that's all very well, but it won't work. You can't do it. But in order to measure it, you actually have to constrict it down into something that's less than it can actually be or even needs to be. In fact, one of the things that became clear in the early part of the 20th century from Heisenberg was that there are some things that as you try to measure them, you actually affect them. So, so, so you're in a dilemma there. That doesn't mean you don't try to measure anything, of course not. It doesn't mean that science is not important and the scientific model is hugely important, but it doesn't answer every question. And it, and it, it is totally unsuitable even for the asking of certain kinds of questions. And you need to have other ways of looking at these things. If the economic model is the same and the management model is the same, they have certain degrees of value. But if you see everything through that lens, you have to distort reality in order to use that lens. And well-being is something that's trying not to distort reality, but to improve reality with all, in all its complexity. So I think it's something that we need to continue to think about and work out and engage with and develop and not try to shrink down into something that fits with the, the models we currently have, but to understand that on the contrary, understanding well-being and explore, exploring it may help us to develop new models of thinking about things in particular uh, models with greater complexity. Now, so this awareness of the irreducible nature of being human is at the core of the Spirit Humanity Forum. To a certain extent, the raison d'être of the forum is precisely to nurture this consciousness, a consciousness of our spiritual dimension, the spiritual dimension of being, the consciousness of our interconnectedness. So the question is, how might this spiritual consciousness shift the global system so that they can become caring, they can become loving? I guess there are a number of thoughts that come to my mind. The first is this understanding of complexity as not something that is reducible down to something else is an important development in human thinking and in science. And it can take us beyond some of the previous understandings of science. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that there's one hugely important area that we really, really don't understand and we are not able to replicate. And that is what we sometimes call consciousness. I don't mean the difference between being awake and being asleep. But that capacity to, to have a, 
a kind of theater of the mind in which you can reflect upon what happens, what's going on inside you, what's going on outside you, that consciousness of that, which no computer that we're able to create, at least so far, has ever been able to develop. The computer's not aware of itself. It does things, it sometimes do things much quicker than human beings or much bigger than human beings, manipulating data and so on. But it's not aware of itself in a way that, that human beings are aware of themselves. That's really important because it's that awareness that is hugely important in the development of our relationships with other people. We are aware of them. We think, how is that person feeling? How is that, what is that person thinking? What are they wanting out of the engagement with me? What am I wanting out of the engagement with them? So if we don't understand that, and don't understand it, it can't be reduced down to atoms and molecules, then we've got some considerable way to go in, de in developing these kinds of things. And then when we try to apply this different approach, not reductionist, but complex approach to the structures of society, uh, and what we want to move forward to, that begins to open up all sorts of new possibilities. But if we really do think that we, we want to develop, we want to move forward, we want things to be, to be better, then this is an important aspect. Now, in, in terms of the politics, you're quite right in what you said, right away back in your introduction to this conversation, that we're at some kind of a watershed where many of the ways we have had of understanding and, and, and running our societies, even those which are better or more progressive or whatever kind of word you like to use, they seem to be coming to the end of their shelf life. They don't seem to be working anymore. And we haven't yet found another way that, that we can envision uh, that, that gives us a new possibility. Well, I think we have to be a little patient with that. Um, to be clear, what are the, the fundamental principles? And if we're saying the principle is better relationships, learning from and letting go of the disturbed historic relationships and trying to develop new and better ones, then if that is our principle, well, it, it will take us a little time and, and, and we need to not lose, lose that focus, not get caught up too much in precise structures or scientific answers or, or theological arguments or anti-theological arguments for that matter, uh, but to, 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 to patiently try to hold that principle uh, before us, that of, uh, of, of the relationship with, with God, however we understand that, and our relationship with other people, however we understand that too. Uh, that, those are the fundamental principles, that the principles of not just of, of, of pretty much all faiths at their best, all philosophies at their best, but, but also of, of those who want to set faiths to the side. Very often they'll still want to hold to those important principles of engaging with, with ourselves and each other and the larger, the larger universe. Um, and, and so that's what we have to hold. And we have to be a little bit patient as well as absolutely committed to taking that forward in our engagement with each other. And I think that that's... Uh, I think that's something of what Spirit of Humanity is about. That sounds like a perfect note on which to conclude this conversation on a narrative of love. I have learned a huge amount from you today. Um, in the meantime, we look forward to welcoming you back to the forum next June, hopefully in Reykjavik, and continue this conversation with others. For now, Thank you from me.